At 10 o'clock, the news now on BBC One with Hugh Edwards. Tonight at 10, first-hand evidence from the front line in Ukraine, two weeks after the counter-offensive began. The modest Ukrainian advance is hard fought and still not the major counter-offensive expected by the Russians. We report from the scene. They're making small gains. The big challenge for them is when they find a major breakthrough and they haven't found that yet. <clears throat> and that could come anywhere along this 1,000 kilometre front line. Yes, we'll have more from Quentin Somerville on the front line in Ukraine. And we'll be asking about the likely timing of a major counterattack also tonight. A mini submarine taking people to see the wreck of the Titanic has gone missing in the Atlantic. The rescue operation is being coordinated in Boston. I'll have the latest details, including reports that a British billionaire was among those on board. The eyes to the right, 354. The nose to the left, seven. In the past few minutes, MPs have approved the report that found Boris Johnson had deliberately misled the Commons over gatherings during the pandemic. Taking place in Beijing, the first high-level meeting between China and the USA in five years, with a pledge to stabilise relations. Oh, he's got him. And at Edgebaston, England takes some lake wickets to set up a tantalising final day in the first Ashes Test. And tonight on BBC London, the speeding driver of the Croydon tram that toppled, killing seven people and injuring dozens of others, walks free from court. We have the full story. Good evening. We start tonight with powerful evidence from the front line in Ukraine, a fortnight after Ukrainian troops intensified their campaign against the Russian invaders. In the south and east of the country, there is a limited operation underway, but it's meant to gather pace and then to liberate wide areas from Russian control. One of the main issues is that the front line stretches over 600 miles, and Russian forces have had months to prepare for the next phase of the conflict. Our correspondent Quentin Somerville has spent time with Ukraine's 68th Jäger Brigade as it pushes eastwards, having recently regained the village of Bladodatne. Uh, Quentin joins us now. So, Quentin, let's ask straight away, what is your sense of the state of this counterattack and the pace at which it's going? We're still at a very slow pace, a very early stage, Hugh. Uh, there are gains, but they're hard won, they're bloody and they're vicious. Ukraine's still searching out for that gap, that weakness in Russian defences to then move through and, and split the Russian occupying forces. If it finds that gap, it could take many weeks from now. Um, it will be a very, very uh, considerable effort by the Ukrainians to push on through. But the men who are currently on the ground, we've been spending time with them this week on the front lines. The struggle to take back what's theirs has begun in earnest. This was Russian-held ground two weeks ago. For Three Storm Brigade, the journey to the front takes longer now. Here in the east and in the south, there's still a long way to go. Ukraine is on the offensive. Russia fought hard to keep this ground, but Three Storm fought harder. Yeah. Step by step, it was mines, maybe Russian mines. So, let's go. This is all Russian equipment and uniforms here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eat, equipment. Rations, everything. The guns are louder now. After months of conserving artillery, it's Ukrainian weapons that ring out. That's small arms fire. That's Ukrainian. Outgoing. You can hear a lot of artillery here as well. Also outgoing much more than before. A Russian shell lands nearby. 
Across these positions, Russian corpses lie uncollected. So they retook these trenches fairly recently. Um, actually a number of Russian dead, at least two, still in there. And they're taking ground to the south of Bakhmut and to the north of Bakhmut. The city itself still firmly under Russian control. But it's very early days in this counter-offensive. They're making small gains. The big challenge for them is when they find a major breakthrough and they haven't found that yet. <clears throat> and that could come anywhere along this 1,000 kilometre front line. It could come here, it could come in the south. And they're attacking on multiple places, just trying to stretch those Russian resources, manpower and weaponry, to breaking point, And then they can smash on through. We travel to another front and another Ukrainian breakthrough. The men of the 68th Jaeger Brigade fought Russian Marines for three days to take the village of Blahadadny. Here is very difficult, very difficult, because uh, this is main uh, different, uh, main uh, uh, area of, of activity for Russian soldiers. Here. And we can see here, it looks like it's been fighting house to house, room by room. Very close. Yeah, this is very difficult. Every uh, every kilometers is very difficult. And and everywhere we walk. I, I know how many people we we lose, but I cannot tell you. Okay. There's more Russian corpses over here. Russian soldiers. One, two, three. There's still a lot of fighting here. You're in range of the Russian guns on the hills. Uh, Russian guns of hills, but uh, main uh, our problem, this is the uh, uh, next point of them. Uh, this is approximately one kilometer, 500 meters from here. That's the Russian position. The Russian positions. Andrei's already giving orders for the next attack. It's imminent. Diesel, it's very important. You need to listen to people. Listen closely and do everything they tell you. And smile. Why are you so serious? We are winning this war. With just hours to go, they pack up everything and ready for the trenches. This specialized drone unit will play a vital part in the assault. While artillery sounds all around them, they have to move fast to get closer still to Russian positions. The cost of this fight is everywhere to see. Destroyed Western-built armor litters the battlefield. But Russia too has lost dozens of tanks and vehicles since this offensive began. On a hot day, east of Blahodatny, the Ukrainian attack begins. The air thickens with artillery and expectation. Ukrainian guns pound the Russian positions and their enemy soon responds. But it's a miss. Yuri of the drone unit can't delay until the shelling stops. The drones he's sending to enemy trenches carry grenades and smoke bombs. They lose as many as five of these a day. And there's more than just artillery to contend with. The Russian helicopters and Russian jets uh, fire every area, uh, every day, every time. Uh, okay. uh, go to shelter. Okay. Oh, good luck. I just illustrated that point very well, that one of the big advantages that the Russians have over the Ukrainians is air power. The Ukrainians are attacking on the ground but the Russians still have helicopters, still have warplanes. It makes it much more difficult for them to advance. The battle won, the danger is far from over. As we make our way back from the trenches, more Russian artillery fire targets Andrei's convoy. We need to move fast. 
and the 49-year-old commander carries an extra burden, the memory of his son. This helmet of my son, a little bit smaller for me, but uh, this is like, uh, like remember. <laughs> this is like remember. This was 21-year-old Ostap, filmed the day before his death. He fought on the same front lines as his father. Two days before the counter-offensive began, he was killed by a Russian drone. It's cost a lot. It's been especially hard for you. You lost your son. Can you tell us a bit about your son, please? He wanted to be a hero for me. He wanted to be a hero for me, and he succeeded. I wanted to protect him, but he wanted to be a hero, and he won. Ukraine may yet win back its land, but there is much here that will never be recovered. Quentin Somerville, BBC News, Donetsk. The reality of uh, life on the front line in Ukraine. That special report by uh, our correspondent, Quentin Somerville. Let's turn to the day's uh, other news. A submersible vessel which takes people to see the wreck of the Titanic has gone missing in the Atlantic Ocean. There's a major search and rescue operation underway with the race to find the vessel before oxygen runs out. The Titanic sank back in 1912 and it lies some 12 and a half thousand feet beneath the surface. Five people were on board the mini-sub and the rescue is being organised in Boston from where our correspondent Jessica Parker reports now. Designed to plunge the depths of the ocean, this is the Titan submersible, now missing in the North Atlantic after contact with the vessel was lost. It sparked a frantic but complicated search. But if it's on the bottom, particularly if it's very deep, it's going to be very difficult to rescue it. Uh, none of the conventional submarine rescue methods, which are designed mainly for naval submarines, would be able to operate down at the depth of the Titanic. Even if it could get down there, the hatches would not match onto, would not mate onto the submersible. A ship carrying the sub left Newfoundland and arrived at the wreck site on Sunday where it then began its journey towards the seabed. But after an hour and 45 minutes, contact was lost. The sub itself is seven metres long and can carry up to five people, typically a mix of crew and paying passengers. There's said to be enough oxygen for four days. It is a challenge to conduct a search in that remote area, but we are deploying all available assets to make sure that uh, we can uh, locate uh, the craft and uh, uh, rescue uh, the, the people on board. In a statement, Ocean Gate said it's exploring all options to bring everyone back safely. The British businessman and explorer Hamish Harding is believed to be among those on board. Slow down, slow down, it's just in front of us. This is what people pay the company Ocean Gate Expeditions nearly £200,000 for a rare and extraordinary view of the Titanic, which has sat nearly 4,000 metres beneath the ocean's surface for more than 100 years. Now an expedition to find this hidden history has itself gone missing. Tonight, an international search operation is underway, 900 miles off this coast in a very remote area. Now, of course, the focus is to try and find the vessel, whether it's now on the surface of the water or underneath. They're using aircraft, they're using sonar technology. But if the vessel is still underwater, that's when things get particularly difficult. And because of the limited oxygen supply, there would also be a limited time in which to find them. Jessica, many thanks once again for the update there. Jessica Parker, our correspondent in Boston. Now, within the past 30 minutes or so, the House of Commons approved a parliamentary report that found Boris Johnson had deliberately misled the Commons about parties during lockdown in Downing Street. 
During the day, the BBC learned that Conservative Party activists who were filmed dancing at a Christmas party during the COVID restrictions in 2020 had been sent invitations to, and I quote, jingle and mingle. Police are reviewing video of the event, which was first published by The Mirror. Our political editor, Chris Mason, has the story. Jingle and mingle, reads the jaunty party invite. Yes, mingle, the very thing the Covid restrictions in London at the time banned. And here is what that party at Conservative headquarters looked like. 30 people were invited. The save the date request appears to have been sent on behalf of Ben Mallet or Ben Mallet OBE as he is now, having been honoured by Boris Johnson for political and public service. A spokesman for Mr Mallet said he didn't send the invitation himself. The party was for people working on Sean Bailey's campaign to be Mayor of London. Mr Johnson has awarded Mr Bailey a peerage, a lifelong seat in the House of Lords. It obviously turned into something once I had left, I didn't realise that. But like I say, I'll say something to the BBC at a later date. Jingling date. and mingling, sir, like, how is that acceptable? It isn't. I, I'm not saying it is for a second. Are you embarrassed that you've been given a peerage, despite the fact that you and your staff were so flagrantly passed? Uh -huh, not me and my staff, my staff, which again, I apologise. This is as close as we got to seeing Boris Johnson today in Oxfordshire, as tonight MPs overwhelmingly backed the report that concluded he'd lied to them. The eyes to the right, 354. The nose to the left, seven. Seven. Who are you? Earlier, we heard from the senior MP who chaired the committee that investigated Boris Johnson. Because he was Prime Minister, Mr Johnson's dishonesty, if left unchecked, would have contaminated the whole of government, mm. allowing misleading to become commonplace. Yeah. Penny Mordaunt, speaking for the government, acknowledged there was a lot in the report and recent debates that would anger people. The lockdown breaches themselves, which grate hard with those who sacrifice so much to keep us all safe, or for others on wider issues such as the debasement of our honours system. He lied to this House, to the people of this country, and when exposed, lashed out at the system designed to hold him and all of us here to account. Very few have defended Boris Johnson, but this Tory backbencher did, saying he passed on in the Commons what he'd been told. They advised him again and again that no rules were broken and that guidance was followed at all times. Theresa May! But take a look at this. Boris Johnson's predecessor was unflinchingly critical. I also say to members of my own party that it is doubly important for us to show that we are prepared to act when one of our own, however senior, is found wanting. Why aren't you engaging in the Boris Johnson debate? As for the Prime Minister, no sign of him in the Commons today. He was instead welcoming his Swedish opposite number to Downing Street. Hugh, the overwhelming mood in the Commons this evening, over five hours of debate, was one of cathartic anger finding an outlet as MPs on all sides were incredibly passionate at their, in their outrage, it often, it often amounted to, in terms of what they felt about Boris Johnson's behaviour. Let me walk you through a little bit of the uh, late-night arithmetic that is going on here. It's always a slightly dangerous game, these kind of numbers. 118 Conservative MPs voted to back uh, this report. That means around about 200 uh, decided not to vote at all. Amongst them, the Prime Minister, as you heard there, he has been nowhere near the House of Commons today and has been ducking questions on this whole theme uh, for the last few days. But in the end, it's only votes that are actually cast that matter. The overwhelming verdict, very clear for Boris Johnson tonight. Chris, many thanks again. Chris Mason, our political editor there at Westminster, with uh, the result of that vote which took place a short while ago. Now, Sir Keir Starmer has been outlining what a future Labour government would do with energy policy, including a ban on new oil and gas exploration, much more reliance on green energy, including new onshore wind farms. He would also set up a publicly owned company called GB Energy to focus on renewable energy sources, uh, and it would be based in Scotland. Our Scotland editor, James Cook, reports now from Leith. Everything about oil and gas is big. 
For half a century, the North Sea has made money by the barrel and pumped out vast quantities of greenhouse gases. But the peak in production has long passed and Labour says the era of exploration must now end. Our next Prime Minister, Keir Starmer. Alongside the Scottish Labour leader, Sir Keir promised to ensure green infrastructure was built in Britain, benefiting British workers. The moment for decisive action is now. If we wait until North Sea oil and gas runs out, the opportunities this change can bring for Scotland and your community will pass us by. And that would be a historic mistake. Oil industry bosses and trade unions appear to be united in opposition to your plans, warning that they would chill investment and cost jobs. Doesn't that worry you? When I look back at what happened with the coal mining communities, with the coal fields, um, and look at the mistakes that were made then, not planning for the future, not having the courage to see the change that was necessary, not leading your nation through that change, I am resolved that we will never repeat that under a Labour government. We will plan for that change. The Conservatives agree that the UK must bring down emissions, but say Labour is abandoning the North Sea. There is now broad agreement that society needs to move away from this stuff, oil and gas, to renewable energy. But there is disagreement about the pace and scale of that transition. Some people worry that the UK is going to be left with a big gap between the amount of energy it produces and the amount it uses. If we ban new oil and gas licences, that will create the very cliff edge we will want to avoid. If we ban new oil and gas licences, that means that we'll undermine the 200,000 people who work in the sector. If we ban new oil and gas licences, that will undermine our energy security while war is raging in, in Ukraine. So will this policy cost jobs? In the short term, it is clear. If we choose to undermine the oil and gas sector, yes, it will cost jobs. But environmentalists want Labour to go further and revoke any new exploration licences granted between now and the election. It's disappointing that he hasn't been firmer on new projects such as Rosebank and Cambo. Climate science is crystal clear that there's no space for any new fossil fuel infrastructure and that means that any new projects in the North Sea cannot be allowed to go ahead. Labour does want to make it easier for wind farms, like this one near Glasgow, to go ahead in England too. But that's also controversial. Change on this scale is not easy. James Cook, BBC News. Now, China and the United States have agreed to keep working on improving their relationship. The agreement was announced during a visit to Beijing by the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. He's been meeting President Xi in what's uh, been billed as a highly symbolic meeting. As our correspondent Stephen McDonnell reports now from Beijing. Good afternoon. First a handshake, then a meeting which carried great hopes that collapsing superpower relations could be restored or at least stabilised. At the Great Hall of the People, China's leader told the US Secretary of State they owed it to the world to try to get along. State-to-state -state interactions should always be based on mutual respect and sincerity. I hope that through this visit, Mr Secretary, you will make more positive contributions to stabilising China-US relations. Of course, China-US relations have been so toxic even modest progress is being celebrated. I would expect additional visits by senior U.S. officials to China over the coming weeks. And we welcome further visits by Chinese officials to the United States. Their previous cooperation on trade, climate change and cross-border crime has all disappeared because of geopolitical rivalry. Most crucially, many military-to-military -military communication channels have stopped operating. There have been some near misses as the aircraft of China and the US challenge one another in contested waters of the South China Sea. Analysts say the possibility of war is no longer remote. China is actually becoming more powerful. Under such circumstances, it's an increasingly dangerous situation in which China and the US could have conflicts. And it is possible that war could happen. If it did, nothing good would come of it for both countries and for the region. Leaders often say they've had frank discussions, but officials associated with these talks say that Antony Blinken and his Chinese counterparts really spoke their minds in meetings which went hours longer than expected. 
There's much at stake for the whole world if relations between Beijing and Washington continue to collapse. And these governments know it. Yet while the US and China are talking up the best, they're also both preparing for the worst. Stephen McDonald, BBC News, Beijing. President Putin's most prominent critic inside Russia, Alexei Navalny, has gone on trial again today, facing a series of charges, including extremism. Our Russia editor, Steve Rosenberg, travelled to the prison about 150 miles east of Moscow and sent this report. On trial again, the jailed Kremlin critic, Alexei Navalny, in the dock, in prison. We were allowed into the penal colony to watch, but only on a video screen. He's facing multiple charges, including extremism, that could keep him locked up for decades. On paper, at least, it is a Moscow court which is hearing this case. And yet this trial is taking place here, 150 miles from the Russian capital, in a makeshift courtroom in a penal colony. And that suggests the Russian authorities want to limit the publicity that would inevitably come from transporting Russia's most high-profile prisoner back to Moscow. But the prison picture show didn't last long. The judge decided the trial should be behind closed doors. The press had to leave. And Mr Navalny's parents. His father Anatoly's reaction... They have no shame. A protest leader and anti-corruption campaigner, Alexei Navalny has long clashed with the Kremlin. I remember this five years ago. Alexei Navalny is Russia's most prominent opposition figure and President Putin's most vocal critic. He's been barred from running in the presidential election. He's now being arrested by police. In 2020, in Siberia, he was poisoned by a nerve agent and airlifted to Germany for life-saving treatment. He claims it was the Kremlin that tried to kill him. The Russian authorities denied. In 2021, he returned to Russia. He was arrested on arrival. He's been behind bars ever since. Russians are told by the state media here that Mr. Navalny is a dangerous extremist. In the town of Mielichova, where the prison colony is, that messaging seems to be working. If they've put him in prison, Anna says, he must have done something wrong. Locked away here, Alexei Navalny's message that Russia needs change is harder to get out. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News, Mielichova, Russia. Let's turn to the day's sport here. And the first Ashes test is delicately poised, heading into the fifth and final day of the first test. Uh, Australia finished the day on 107 for three, chasing 281. Our correspondent Patrick Geary was watching the play at Edgebaston. Monday morning, either an opportunity or a chore. Sunday's rain cleared to leave a test poised perfectly or precariously. England always look on the bright side. Pressure won't change that. Just watch Joe Root. This team are flipping the conventions of test cricket one shot at a time. But there are no guarantees it'll work every time. Root fooled, stumped off Nathan Lyon for 46. Big wicket, big moment. Time for leadership. Captain Ben Stokes guided his side further ahead, England's picture improving with every run. But the Australian bowlers continued to scramble things. When Stokes was out, they were back in it. Ollie Robinson has been proving an irritant to the Aussies with chat and now bat. Together with the tail, he lifted England up to a total of 280 before they were bowled out at tee. So, how were your nerves? The last innings, Australia's innings, and they began it well. They were 61 without loss when Robinson had his say again. David Warner gone, Edgebaston up, so Stuart Broad had something to feed off. As a cricketer, this is who he is, what he does. That was Marnus Labashain, best in the world. Steve Smith is number two, gone to Broad, two in an evening of adrenaline. Well, what an end to the day for England, but Australia did score 107 runs, so a lot might depend on the weather, and will it allow us the finish that this test match deserves?
Patrick Geary, BBC News, at Edgbaston. And to football, in tonight's uh, European Championship qualifiers, Bukayo Saka scored a hat-trick as England beat North Macedonia 7-0. But Wales and Northern Ireland were less happy with their results. Andy Swiss reports. But as North Macedonia discovered, talent is timeless. Saka's first was ferocious, rounded off by Harry Kane, which puts them in sight of qualification. Was his hopes, while well, there was a straighting night. Andy Swiss, BBC News. Time has just turned uh, 10.30. Let's uh, catch up with the weather. And Matt is with me. Hi, Matt. Hi there, Hugh. Calm start, uh, calm end to the day, I should say. Start to the night, even. And uh, things will change, though, tomorrow. Storm clouds are gathering yet again. Let me just show you the big picture. Across the Bay of Biscay, these have been gathering. These clouds have been producing thunderstorms. And look at their heading heading their way northwards towards it. At the same time, the cloud that brought the showers and thunderstorms across northern Scotland, that's clearing away. So whilst one end of the country turns a little bit quieter tonight, the other end could turn a bit lively. Southwest England, Wales in particular, some heavy and thundery downpours to take us into the morning and fairly humid here as well. Much of us, well, we start with temperatures in double figures. Scotland, Northern Ireland, Northern England, other than isolated shower, most will have a dry morning. But just look what's happening down here. The overnight rain will clear away from the southwest. Heavy thundery rain, Wales, the Midlands, a little bit more erratic the rainfall, East Anglia in the southeast. Like recent days, uh, short space of distance, you could see huge variations in how much rain falls. But where we do see it, it could have an impact on the rush hour and through the morning through northern England. By the afternoon, that spreads its way across the eastern fringes of Scotland, brightening up then across England and Wales, isolated heavy and thundery showers, some very close to Edgbaston, maybe Queen's. But western Scotland, Northern Ireland, will see some frequent showers and again, the odd rumble of thunder with it. Temperatures in the sunny moments in the 20s once again. Bit of a change though as we go through into Wednesday, air of low pressure to the north of us now, and that means more of a westerly breeze. So feel a little bit fresher again. Mixture of sunshine and showers. Showers most frequent, closer to that low pressure in the north of the country, pushing across the sky quite quickly, so a fairly varied day. Further south, fewer showers, more in the way of dry weather. And with more sunshine, it should feel a little bit warmer. As we go through the end of the week, though, towards the weekend, whilst showers are still in the forecast, could get warmer and more humid yet again. Hugh. Matt, many thanks once again. And that's it. Now on BBC One, it's time for the news where you are. Have a good night. Good evening, I'm Assad Ahmed. The driver of a tram that crashed in Croydon, killing seven people, has walked free from court. Alfred Doris was speeding at more than three times the limit when the tram toppled over in November 2016. Well, families of survivors say they feel the system has let them down. Our transport correspondent Tom Edwards has been following the case. An everyday commute that ended in horror, tram 2551, overturned on this sharp corner on a dark morning going into Sandylands tram station in South London. The driver was Alfred Doris, seen here in the middle. He was today acquitted of failing to take reasonable care of his passengers. Outside court,